به زهرا ال اجل یوسف زهرا ال اجل یوسف زهرا محمد و آل طاهرین الله صل علی محمد و آل محمد Continuing with Surah Al-Mudathir, Mudathir with two shandas. Not Mudathir, but Mudathir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa ma ja'alna ashaab al-Nar illa malaikata wa ma ja'alna adatam illa fitna. Al-Ladhina kafaru li yastaykin al-Ladhina mutu al-Kitab wa yazdan al-Ladhina amanu iman. We reached that point where we have a problem. That problem was that we have some verses in the Quran regarding the guidance and misguidance of people. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says that I am the one who misguides and I am the one who guides. And sometimes it makes it sound like He randomly wants that. He randomly wants to guide and misguide people. Why? Because he says, "May yasha, whoever I want. I guide whoever I want, I misguide whoever I want. To understand verse 30, well, verse 30 has a translation that we can understand, 31. But to get some good lessons out of verse 31, that's why I'm not opening the verse up yet. Although we started this discussion yesterday. I haven't opened it up yet because we have to fix this problem first in theory. How Allah guides and misguides people. Once we take care of that, then we can come back to the verse and understand what it's saying. To fix the problem, to, uh, uh, to the root of the problem, as a matter of fact, we have two ways of fixing the problem straight up. No need to get into details. Number one is to fix our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean? If we have learned Tawheed in a good way, in the right way, in a way that we at least know the more general aspects, general characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, we will understand that He is all just. It's impossible for Him to hold responsible someone that is not to be held accountable. Because when you accidentally, out of mistake, or for whatever reason, hold someone responsible for something they haven't done, force someone to do something that is not good, it's either because you don't know that that person, that, that this is something bad, this means you're limited in your knowledge. Or you mistakenly hold them responsible while you weren't supposed to, that means you were mistaken. That means once again you're not infallible, you make mistakes. Once again it goes back to your knowledge being limited. Or you might do it because you want to get, you want to, although you know it's oppression, but you're going to oppress them because you want to make yourself feel better, and so on. Whatever the reason is, they will always come back to the fact that you have a flaw in yourself if you oppress someone, if you hold them responsible for something they haven't done. If you force them to do something, then you hold them responsible for it. These things are impossible when it comes to Allah and the essence of Allah. If someone has taken care of these general characteristics of Allah, they will, it won't be hard for them to know that this verse, when it says, or all those, those verses that, that I recited for you yesterday, that say Allah misguides whoever He wants, guides whoever He wants. You understand that that's not what it means necessarily, because that will go back to Allah being an oppressor even. Just the fact that he is hurt, holding someone responsible for something they haven't done, they're not responsible for. That should be enough for us. So if there are some details in the Qur'an, in the hadith, that we don't know about, then we just have to say, Allah knows best. Very simple. This shouldn't eat away at me, at my mind. Just because I don't know why Allah is saying it like this shouldn't cause any problems. Because I know Allah is all just on one hand. It's like you, if someone comes to you and says, your mom said this behind your back. What did she say? She said, I don't want him to exist or her to exist. I wish I would die. Your mom said that about you. 
You say, I know what she meant. I know that she's just angry. She loves me so much, she would never want that to happen to me, inshallah. So the fact that you know your mother of close, and the fact that you know she would die for you any day, any day, this is evidence that when she said something, she didn't mean it in that way. She probably meant something else. Same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we take care of getting to know Allah better, then if He says certain things that we feel, oh, that kind of sounds wrong, we won't jump to conclusions. That's one of the roots of the problems, is that we, don't have, we haven't set those foundations yet of Allah. That's one. Here, in this specific uh, verse of the Qur'an, where it says Allah will guide and misguide whoever He wants, whoever He desires, the problem that's, hap- that's happening here, the mistake that we're making sometimes is that we are taking Allah's wanting to be like our wanting. The same way we want something, Allah wants things the same way. So there's sometimes we want something randomly. Sometimes we want something for somebody because we like them more, they look better, they're cooler, whatever. Sometimes we want something for somebody or, so- or we want something for ourselves because we're ignorant of that thing, the harms of it, the good of it, the bad of it. But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't want things randomly. Because once again, it will, fall, it will go back to Him being flawed, deficient, somewhere in His knowledge, somewhere in His will, somewhere in His power. Sometimes we want something because it's easier. Does Allah want things because they're easier? For Allah, everything is easy. Remember I gave you the example? Allah is looking from the top. When you look at from the top as a wajibul wujud, everything is mumkinul wujud, that means everything's existence relies on you. It doesn't matter how big or small things are, how heavy or light things are. The existence of all of these things lies in the hand of Allah. Even when Allah in the Quran says, La khalqu samawati wal ard, that the, that the creation of the heavens and the earth was harder, O oh man, than the creation of insan, the Quran says, even there we will have to interpret it in a certain way. That means that according to your standards, it will be harder. Or else for Allah, there is no hard and easy. For Allah, it's all one. It's all one. The creations of the heaven and the earth for Allah is the same as the creation of an ant. Because the existence of each of these relies in, is, is, is in the hand of Allah. Alright, so such a God who has such greatness, He's not going to wish things the way we wish things, the way we want things. So our misunderstanding of this particular verse is due to the fact that I, it sounds like, He's doing it randomly. He guides whoever He wants, misguides whoever He wants. Just like the bully in school says, I beat up whoever I want. Right? Or how Fir'aun or... Um, I don't remember which one of those enemies of Allah it was. Maybe it was Fir'aun or maybe it was someone else. Or it was the, per- the person that was the enemy of uh, Prophet Ibrahim in Prophet Ibrahim's time, if I remember correctly. Where he said, I kill whoever I want and I give life to whoever I want. He was arguing with Prophet Ibrahim. He told Prophet Ibrahim, السلام, I hope I'm not making a mistake here. I think it's Prophet Ibrahim. That I, I take the life of whoever I want and I give life to whoever I want. So he, they say he brought a few people or two people. He killed one of them and he let the other one live. He says, see, just like your Lord gives life and takes life, I take life and give life. So right there, the Prophet says to, to this person, he says, okay, fine, that's cool. Let me see you bring, my Lord brings the sun out of the, the east. Let me see you bring it out from the west and then make it sat from the east. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي kafar. The Quran says, that person who was trying to be all that, فَبُهِتَ He was just like in awe. He just like stopped. He's like, dang, I can't do that. فَبُهِتَ الَّذِي kafar. Put him where he was supposed to be, the Prophet. Misalli salawat. Okay, sorry. 
This, the problem is that we're seeing him like that. Okay. So how is he? Let's solve this problem. He himself is saying, يُدِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ يَهْتِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He guides whoever he wants, misguides whoever he wants. Alright. How do we fix that now? Well, I just said we don't need to fix it. Let's just go on. No, we'll fix it. Because the Qur'an has fixed it for us. The Qur'an has put its finger on it and explained it. But if we couldn't find the answer, was that going to cause a problem? No. Because we know about Allah. We know how He is. We know there's no deficiency in Him. So if He says something that, has, that can have two meanings, we'll take the right meaning, not the wrong meaning. I want. That's how I want things, so that's how Allah wants things? No. That's not how Allah wants. Surah Muddathir, verses 26 to 31. These are the verses that we're studying right now. They have solved the problem. They give you a clue in there. When we read the verse 31, in the end, well, let me read the translation to you. We made the keepers of the saqar, we made them angels. What about their number? 19. It says that we made their number a fitna, a test. Okay. A test for believers, disbelievers, for everybody. People, some of them hear this, they start mocking. I gave you the story of Abu Jahl and his buddies. Abu Jahl said, I will take out 17 of these keepers. I looked, I looked it up kind of today. He said, I'll take care of 17 of them. The, the other two, you, my, my buddies will take care of. They started mocking. These people, this was a test that Allah put in front of them. It was a fitna, the verse says. Some people passed this test, some people failed. Some said, this is from Allah, we will take it as a fact. Some people mocked it, they went down because of this. What did Allah do? Did He misguide or guide people? No, He just put a test in front of them. He put a fitna, fitna means test, in front of them. He put the, some of the translations say, He put a stumbling block in front of them. I'm going to need this later. Allah, when He guides and misguides, He puts a stumbling block in front of you. That's it, a step. If your eyes are closed, you'll trip. If your eyes are open, you won't trip. True, he put the stumbling block there, and you can in a way say, he tripped me up, but it was my fault that my eyes were closed. It was my fault that I failed that test. In the end of the verse, after all of what I said, it goes like this. كَذَلِكَ يُضِلُّ اللَّهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ one word solves the whole problem. Kadalik. <clears throat> this is how Allah guides and misguides people. Not only does it say that, it says this is how Allah guides and misguides whoever He wants. You see how it's explaining how Allah wants things? How Allah guides and misguides? He'll put a stumbling block in front of you. And then you trip up. Other people see the steps to, that he has put that are going up to him. They'll put their foot on the step and go higher. He put the step there so we go higher. But your eyes are closed. You fell. This is how, the verse says, this is how we must guide and misguide. So it's not that he takes faith out of somebody's heart, puts faith in somebody's heart, and he just does it randomly. No, you choose to be guided. Allah guides you. You choose to be, close your eyes and be misguided. Allah misguides you. Not that He misguides you. He puts a step in front of you. Another verse that we have. Surah Baqarah, verse 26. Talks about how Allah speaks about the ba'uda, the mosquito or fly. What does the Qur'an say? The Qur'an says, some people when they hear this verse, this example or parable of the mosquito or fly, the ba'uda, what do they do? They fail the test. Surah Baqarah, verse 26. Inna Allah la yastahi an yadriba mathalan ma ba'uda. God does not hesitate to set forth the parable of even a gnat. Here it's talking about gnat. It says gnat. That's how they've translated it. Okay. So Allah talks about a gnat. Sounds very insignificant, right? But this gnat is doing big stuff. Why? 
The believers know that it is the truth from their Lord. This parable that Allah uses and sets forth, this is truth, the believers. But those who deny the truth, they say, what does God mean by such parables? They're making fun of it. They're not really making, asking a question. They're making fun of God. What does He mean by this? Ha, ha, ha. He's talking about a mosquito. Ha, ha, ha. They start mocking. Their iman goes down. The iman of the believers goes up. What do the believers say? The believers say that this is from our Lord. This is a test to see if we're going to mock or if we're going to take it. And then in the end of the verse it says this. It says, فَيَقُولُونَ مَاذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهِ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا يُذِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُذِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ Allah here says that I misguide people like this, through this, through the net, through a mosquito. Giving a story about a mosquito. This is how I misguide. I talk about a net, I talk about a mosquito, they laugh. Okay, fine, laugh. But since you're laughing, you're mocking Allah's words, you're going down. This is how Allah is going to misguide. He's going to talk about a mosquito. Not that he takes faith out of the heart, puts into the heart, nothing like that. Alright, so now we have the problem is solved. This problem was solved. That this is how Allah guides and misguides. Now let's go back. Let's go back to those verses that we talked about, that we messed things up with. Now let's go back knowing that this is how Allah guides and misguides. We can easily understand these verses. Let's go. Surah Nahal verse 93. وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَكِنْ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِمْ مَنْ يَشَاءُ If Allah wanted, He would have made you all one people, unified around Tawheed. He didn't do that though, because He guides and misguides whoever He wants. Based on the explanation that was given, what is the interpretation of this verse now? It means that Allah could have forced you to be mu'min and Muslim. But Allah sends tests some people mess up, some people don't mess up. So they're going to be on the right track, the others are not going to be on the right track. Not that He doesn't let you come on the right track, even though if you want to come on it. Surah Nur verse 21. If Allah wanted, He could have. If He doesn't want, none of you will be purified. Who does He want purification for? Those who people who obey Him, Allah will purify them. Not that He wants to purify this guy because he's good looking, that guy because he's not good looking. No, no, no. You see how those verses are helping us to tafsir here and understand these verses. This was that very unfair verse. Some people see it as unfair. Allah seals their hearts, their eyes, their ears. They can't see, they can't hear. You can't understand the truth. There's a great punishment waiting for them. Based on this understanding that we have gained now by those verses. What do we understand from this verse? Allah means those people who didn't want the truth. The hujjat was finished. There was no excuse left. They turn away from it. Okay, Allah says you turned away from it. You turned away from it. Finished. You turned away from it. So I don't want guidance for you anymore because you don't want it. One by one, these verses become more and more clear. وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَأَتَيْنَا كُلَّ نَفْسٍ هُدَاهَا وَلَكِنْ حَقَّ الْقَوْلُ مِنِّي لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ This was another unfair verse. So-called unfair, quote-unquote, unfair verse. That if I wanted, I could have given the guidance of every person to them. But... What I want is going to happen, that I'm going to fill the, heaven, the hell with man and jinn. Ajma'in, all of them. Well, based on other verses that we looked at now, we see that we have to open a bracket here. And reinterpret the verse. That if we wanted, we would have given every person their guidance, but they have to want it themselves. They have to, when we put the tests in front of them, they have to pass the test. Passing the test equals guidance. They don't want it for themselves. So we're going to take them to the hellfire. Even if I'm saying I'm going to take all of them, it means all of those who fa fail the test. Not even the good ones. The good ones, it's impossible for Allah to take them to hellfire. It doesn't read with His justice. That's why it's impossible. Although He's all-powerful, but He's also all-just. He won't do anything that's not just. If I understand that this is oppression, 
then Allah doesn't understand that this is oppression? Taking someone to the hellfire that doesn't deserve to go to the hellfire? Okay. So these verses that we're talking about, talk, they're talking about Walid going to the Sakar. I have to emphasize this again, that these verses that are talking about the scorching hellfire and all of those bad things that happen in the hellfire are talking about people like Walid bin Mughayra who are mushrik, who turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone might say this doesn't sound fair. Still, why doesn't Allah even help these people? Brothers and sisters, the other side, meaning the akhirah, is a place where you get what you did. You're, what you're getting is your own doing. It's not that Allah is waiting there to reve- take revenge. Yes, we have verses that Allah is muntaqim. فَيَنْتَقِمْ minhum. Allah says, I take revenge. But even those, we have to revisit their interpretation. Allah brings us into this world. He lets us know that there is a straight and direct link between what we do here and what we do there. Okay. Follow with me here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that on the other side, the only way one person can be delivered is to have him. To have him, at least. Even if you're like the greatest sinner of all, but you have him, there will still be hope. It's like that teacher who tells her students, listen kids, I know you haven't studied. I know you don't know the answers sometimes. But listen, when, you're, when I give you the test papers, Write something. Don't leave your test paper blank. That way I can show as much leniency as I can. Okay? Those teachers that are out there that do this, thank you. (laughs) Or else we wouldn't have made it to higher levels of education maybe. So, this is the teacher saying, have the little minimum at least. Write something. Those people who have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have something at least. I'm not saying this is the best to do. But at least they have him. People like Walid are the ones who have istikbar and inad. They are animosity towards Allah. And they have istikbar that there's no hope for them. Allah lets us know in this life, listen, at least have me. Why? Why? Because when we go on that side, if there's going to be any good, it's going to be linked to him. If a person is an enemy of Allah, turns away from Allah, doesn't have Allah, that means he doesn't have anything on the other side. The only hope on the other side is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person turns away from Allah completely, is an enemy of Allah, will not have Allah on the other side. That's why he gets saqar. That's why he gets the lowest levels of hellfire. It's not that Allah, you know, if he had a chance, he wouldn't help this person. But this person has not even left 1% of hope. Because he's an enemy of Allah, he's turned away from Allah. Allah says, okay, you don't have me. If you had me a little bit, I would have helped you. At least I would have tried my best to help you. And that is the explanation of verses like, إِنَّ الشِّرْكْ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Shirk! When you don't have Allah, Allah at all, is a great oppression, not to Allah. You can't oppress Allah. You're oppressing yourself. You're forcing yourself to miss out on so much in the future because you're pushing him away. The only person that can help you, pushing him away completely. It's like that kid that runs away from home. A kid that runs away from home, the dad or mom will tell them, we know you're angry at us. We know you wanted something, we didn't get it for you. But at the end of the day, we're the most caring for you. If you're going to run away from home, you won't have anyone else. Yes, you might go to your friends, you might go to your relatives or whatever, but in the end, at the end of the day, they won't, they'll get tired. If you want hope, stay with me, your, fa- your father or your mother. Don't, you won't be able to find anything like this anywhere else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, whatever you do, don't turn away from us. Whatever you do, don't turn away from me. People like this get the saqar, when they don't even leave 1%. So there's a lot of hope for the rest of us, inshallah. Saying all of this reminds me of a story, actually, that I think, I think it was Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Muhammad 
In this story, some of you might have heard it, there's a person who has a drinking problem. But apparently he's a follower of the, of the Imam. So one day he's carrying like a container of this of this liquor, this haram liquor. And he walks into an alley and he sees that the imam is coming from the other side of the alley. He can't turn back and run away. He, and, but at the same time, he doesn't want the imam to see that he's drinking this, this poison, this najis, haram substance that we have some hadith that all evil lies in intoxicants and khamar, wine and things like that. And of course, this is not something that we're struggling with, inshallah, in this community. He sees the Imam coming. What does he do? When you're put on the stop, you spot, you don't know what to do. He turns to the wall and kind of like hides his face or something. But he's holding that container still. The Imam gets closer and closer and passes by. And he whispers to this man and tells him in his ear, he says, Listen, no matter what you do, Never, never, never turn your butt back on us Ahlul Bayt. Don't turn your back. This, what, what, what other hope do you want? Who's going to do shafa on the Day of Judgment for you? Yes, you've done wrong. Turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very simple. Turn back to us Ahlul Bayt. It's very simple. The problem, once again, brothers and sisters, is that we look at things through our own lens. In that story of God misguiding and guiding, we were tr in tr interpreting Allah's wish and desire the way we look at our own wish and desire. It's random. Sometimes we know it's wrong, but we still do it. Here also, same story, brothers and sisters. If someone wrongs us, usually it's hard for us to forgive them. Especially if that person, we've done so much for them. They're weaker compared to us. We've done someone so much good. They come over to our house, they steal something from our house. I mean, come on. It's not that easy to forgive such a person. Like, come on. How could you do that? We look at it like that. And then when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we look at it the same way. We say, how can he even forgive me? I mean, I've turned my back, my back so much. How can he even forgive me? It's impossible for him to forgive me. This is wrong. This is you bringing Allah down again. This is us bringing Allah down again. That's not how it works with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He changes the bad things we've done to good, to thawab, to reward. Not only does He erase, He puts good instead of the bad. Come on. I mean, how much more hope can He give us? Hadith says, Woe unto the person who his tens are more than his ones. Do you know what that means? How many rewards does Allah give us when we do a good act? Ten. How many evil acts do we get when we do something bad? One. The Quran says, Ashra amthaliha. Ten times, whenever we do something good, ten times we're getting a reward. But when we do something bad, we just get that reward, that, just that one uh, punishment. Or bad deed written down in our report card. Okay. The hadith says, woe to that person. That person is in bad shape. A person whose tens are, more, are less than his ones. That means this person has done so much evil, that although this was counting as ten times more, still his bad deeds are more than his good deeds. I mean, come on, how much more should Allah do? But still there is hope here. Amen. But how do I know that my repentance has been accepted? One of the great akhlaqi teachers, he said this once. <clears throat> he said, if you see that you have done something wrong and you repent, and you don't go back to it again, what does that mean? That means your repentance has been accepted. Very simple. But I've heard that Imam Ali salam he says in Nahjul Balagh or elsewhere, <laughs> that a true repentance is a repentance that your meat and flesh melts away. The flesh that you did a haram with, you're going to not eat and drink so much that the flesh of your body goes that you did haram with. Brothers and sisters, these same great akhlaqi teachers say that's not for us, that's not for me and you. For us, just the fact that you make a decision not to go back to it is enough for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do I know it's accepted though? Just the fact that you're not going back to it again is the sign that it was accepted. 
So that means that when I repent, but I go back to it again, it's not accepted? Yes, that's a sign that it's not accepted. So what do I do? Well, repent again. This time try your best not to do it. And if you don't go back to it, it's inshallah is accepted. But what if I go back to it again? Repent again. Repent again. There's nothing wrong with... We're not going to fool ourselves. Astaghfirullah, do the haram again. Astaghfirullah, do the haram again. That's not what we're going to do. But what we are going to do is that if we mess up, we will try our best. I know I'm boring some of you because I've said this so much, but I'll say it again and again and again. Because that's how our teachers taught us. They said it again and again and again until we believed it. It's all about this, that's all. There's nothing else to it. And eventually, when Allah sees that you are struggling, you're trying, but you're failing, He will take your hand. Ayatollah Khushvakt would say this. He'll take your hand when he sees you falling so much, but you're trying to get back up. It's better than just feeling and then lying down on the ground. <clears throat> okay. We're not going to run away from Allah like the kid who runs from home. Having said all of this now, having said all of this, let's talk about the number 19 a little bit more. So I said we have to have those, that basic understanding of Allah. That should be enough to know what He means by certain things or what He doesn't mean by certain things. Then I said in this specific verse where it talks about Him wanting to guide and misguide, we shouldn't compare His wanting to our wanting. We talked about that as well. We explain all of this. Then we come to the number 19 in this verse. Before that, to get an idea of What's going on even in this verse? Let's do the translation and a little story that's behind this verse. Recite a salawat, please. I can bring this verse up. Yes. I'll just read the translation because it's a very long verse compared to the other verses in this surah. It goes, We have made only angels as the keepers of the fire. For they are the strongest in carrying out our commands. This is an explanation. This is just in brackets. Our informing the people of the numbers of these angels, the number which was 19, is a trial for the disbelievers. So I explained that. It's a stumbling block. Allah puts in front of us because we're here for the workout. We're here to climb the ladder. We're here to climb the steps to Allah. Allah will put steps so that we can reach Him. It gives more certainty to the people of the book and strengthens, strengthens, strengthens the faith of the believers. What does that mean? The verse says that it, 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 it gives more conviction and yaqeen to the people of the book. What's it talking about? The story goes like this. They came to the Prophet, the people of the book. Some accounts, some ahadith say this. They came to the Prophet and apparently in their books, not the books that they have today, but in their, the books that were not altered. They come to the Prophet and ask him about the number of the keepers of the Saqqar, of the hellfire. It was in their books apparently. They wanted to see if this Prophet is telling the truth or not. Let's ask him something that there's no way he could have found out about it. If he was not a Prophet. So they ask him, what's the number of the keepers of the hellfire? He says 19. The angel of revelation comes down and these verses are revealed. Alayha tis'ata ashar. And then the next verse explains why we said the number 19. One, it's a test. Two, liyastayqan utul kitab. So that those people who are of the book, the Nasara, the Yahud, the Jews and the Christians of that time, they can gain conviction that, oh, this prophet is really a prophet. He has access to a divine knowledge, or else he wouldn't have known 19. So that more certainty can come to the people of the book and strengthens the faith of the believers as well. How does that happen? Two reasons why. One, they hear the number 19, they say, this is from Allah. We will accept it because it's from Allah. The more submission, the more iman grows. That's one. Number two, another possibility is that when the Yahud and Nasara heard this from the Prophet and they, they've realized that the Prophet is truthful in his claim 
and they embrace the, the religion, those who have already embraced it, when they see this happening, their iman grows more. They are more assured, so to speak, of the message of this Prophet. So the believers are also growing in faith because of one of these two reasons, or maybe even both of them. The people of the book and the believers have no doubt about it. We have fixed the number to make the disbelievers and those whose hearts are sick. We've done this for them to say, what does God mean by such parable, by such number? They start mocking. Allah wants submission even when it comes to facts, brothers and sisters. Allah says, I'm everything. I want you to stick to me through whatever excuse it is. Even if it means me saying the number 19 and you saying, thank you for telling us. Allah wants submission even when it comes to facts. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ I don't see angels. Who says there's angels? The Quran says. Do you believe the Quran is the book of God? Yes, I believe that. But I'm not seeing them. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Because Allah said, please believe. Because Allah says there's akhirah, please believe. Because Allah says, I'm in charge of everything, but you don't understand that, please believe it at least. The more submission, even when it comes to facts, the more your iman grows. What do they say though? They make fun. Thus, God guides and causes to go astray whomever He wants. See how a little bit of a mistranslation here can cause problems? Allah had explained in this verse how He guides and misguides through the word kadalik. Kadalik means this is how, like this, like such, like so. That's what it means. What did the translation say though? Thus, God. That's why we need tafsir sometimes. The translation might not cut it. Does that mean that we're not going to read translation from now on? No, we're going to read translation. But we always have to keep in mind, when it comes to deeper understanding, there is more. There is more. Thus, we're going to erase that. This is how God guides and causes to go astray whomever He wants. No one's about the army of your Lord except He Himself. This parable is a reminder for mankind. Allah only knows how many angels He has. Allah knows only how many angels are taking care of the hellfire. His army, those who serve Him, only He has knowledge of them. وَمَا هِيَ إِلَّا ذِكْرَ لِلْبَشَرَ These things we say are a reminder for the people. Okay. So as you can see, the verse doesn't disclose the number 19. All it says is that this 19 was a test. But now the question is, does Allah just you know, say 19 and there's no reality to it? Why 19? Why didn't He just say 20 then? Why such an odd number? Here, Shahid Mutahari has a good point. Shahid Mutahari has a good point here. He says this number 19 isn't just a number that Allah, you know, He just chose because it was so odd. No. Angels, as we all know, they are carrying out different tasks. The angel of death, he carries the task of taking the lives of the people. The number of attributes that Allah has, asma that Allah has, Allah gives to His angels. The, as the ism of mumit, the one who takes the life, who gives mouth, Allah is the mumit. But He gives it to whomever He wants. He gives it to the angel of death. He says, take care of this. And there's an interesting story here actually. I'll, I'll share with you. That Allama Qadi Rahmatullah Alayh, the Ustad of Ayatollah Bahjat, of Allama Tabtabai and others. I keep repeating these names because I want us to remember them. From now on, if anyone walks up to you in the street and asks you who's Allama Qadi, you'll say he's the Ustad of Ayatollah Bashat, Allama Tabtabai, and others. Anyone on the street, from any race, any religion, I don't know why they'll ask you that. But if for whatever reason they'll ask you, you can say it now because we've said their names so much. Allama Qadi, this is a story that is in, once again, that Ruha Mujarrad book that I was talking about the other day. There, it goes like this, the story, that a person had come, I love this story, this person, a person was meeting, sees Allah Maqadi outside of the Masjid of Kufa. Those of you who have been to Masjid of Kufa, you know there's a lot of A'mal there. Lots of two rakat salats that they pray inside there. He comes to Allah Maqadi and 
Allah Maqadi is sitting outside, maybe resting a little bit before he goes in for the a'mal of the masjid. This person said, I sat next to Allah Maqadi and I started asking questions. All of a sudden, while, we're, while I was asking questions, a snake comes out and is passing by. It's probably a dangerous snake. He says, Allah Maqadi points to the snake and he says, Mut bi'idnillah. Die in the name of Allah, by the permission of Allah. And all of a sudden, the snake freezes there. Okay, I want to wake you people up before iftar time. He freezes, that, that snake all of a sudden, he freezes. And so this person says, I went on um, talking about asking Allah Maqadi different questions. We went inside while we were doing a'mal. All of a sudden, while I'm doing a'mal, it struck me. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. That snake froze. He says, throughout the a'mal, from there on, I wasn't paying attention to what I was saying. All I could think about was, let's let these a'mal finish so I can go back out and see what happened. Was it really what I saw? Or After the a'mal are over, he says, I went and I saw the snake right there, still frozen, the same curly way it was, probably frozen. Some of the, not even prophets, not even Ahlul Bayt, not, let alone the angels, the Asma'ullah, some of them sometimes in a limited way are given to the awliyaullah even let alone the angels allah he has his angels take care of tasks each task has to do with ismullah one of the asmaullah or maybe more than one of asmaullah i don't know the point being when it says 19 angels are there that means there are 19 angels taking care of the tasks of the hellfire that have to do with Asma'ullah that are governing the hellfire. That means that this isn't just a subjective number, a number that I just you know feel like saying it. No. It shows that apparently there are 19 tasks when it comes to taking care of the hellfire. Because there are 19 tasks, Allah appoints 19 angels. If there were 20, Allah would have appointed 20. If there were 15 tasks, Allah would have appointed 15 angels. Since there are 19 tasks, Allah appointed 19 angels. It's not like he just flipped through numbers and he sees this one's the oddest one I can find. And the closest one to 911. The number 19, I'm going to appoint because it's the oddest number. I want to get people's attention. Shaykh Mutari has a beautiful point here. Look at this observation. It's like you having 19 kids. I don't know if to say God forbid or not, but just, let's just say, assuming someone has 19 kids, and then people go and ask him, or like he's filling out a form, how many children do you have? 19. And then the person who looks at the form starts laughing and rolling on the floor. Ah, oh, 19, what an odd number. Ha ha. Couldn't you just write 20? Couldn't you write 15? He says, my friend, I have 19 kids. You're asking me how many kids I have to write 19. It's an objective reality. It's a reality that I have 19 kids. You're asking me what the truth is. I'm supposed to tell you the truth, right? Or else you wouldn't ask for my signature at the bottom that everything I said here was true. It's not up to me to choose how many kids that I have right now. Although I have 19, I'm going to write 20. No, no, there's 19 kids, so I'm going to write 19. Allah says there are 19 tasks. That's why I appointed 19 angels. I am one. That's why in the Quran I say, I say I am one. I count your good deeds as 10. That's why in the Quran I use the number 10. Whatever it is, the reality, I'm telling you, the reality is that there are 19 people who are taking care of the hellfire because there are 19 tasks. This I don't know how I would have ever come to this conclusion, but Shaykh Mutahiri says this is beautiful. I looked, I didn't find this in Allama Tawtawai, in Al Mizan, I didn't find it. I didn't do a thorough search. But look, this is one of the students of Allama Tawtawai. He's able to bring this conclusion out. Where, where did he get it from? He goes to those verses that talk about angels, how angels are taking care of the task that Allah has. From this, he derives that, okay, then that must mean that there must be 19 tasks here. That's why there was a need for 19 angels. This is the diqqa. This is the 
this is how deep sometimes our ulama can go. I just, I don't know if I'll be able to finish this or not. There's one more point I wanted to make about the punishment of Allah. Let me, let me talk about it. Let me talk about it. This whole story of Walid bin Mughayrah and him being an enemy of Allah, that he is the one who's going to be scorched. And it's not the case that others are going to be scorched necessarily the way Walid is going to be. Those people who have Allah to an extent. Those people who are regretful of what they did. Sometimes we just make mistakes and so on. Sometimes the fact that the Qur'an has spoken so much about the Akhirah and so much about Jahannam and the Hellfire, we feel like, we feel like if Allah doesn't take a lot of people to the Hellfire, then all these verses that spoke about the details of the Hellfire, you know, it's a waste, you know? For Allah not to take them all to hellfire while we have so many verses that are talking about it. You know, you feel like, it's like you, you make a house with so much furniture in it, but no one's going to ever go and live in it. We feel like Allah created the hellfire and now He's given us so many verses that talk about the details of the hellfire. And you, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not worth it, you know, like let's make sure that at least a lot of people go to the hellfire. We have to be careful when it comes to these things. Just because Allah has spoken a lot about it, just because there's so many details about it, we, th this doesn't mean necessarily that a lot of people are going to go. It's, it's hard. And that's why you hear sometimes ulama, now these are secrets, I, I'm not supposed to say these things. But sometimes you see ulama saying that those people who will be in the hellfire forever, khalidun, khalidun, they're not too many. You might even be able to count them with your fingers. Allah might make it. I like how there's a silence now. <laughs> Allah might make it sound like that. But is that necessarily going to happen? We don't know. I'll give you an example. When it comes to the punishments that we have for certain crimes in an Islamic government. I don't want to say Islamic state anymore. You see how they've destroyed the image of the word Islamic State. May Allah rid the world of their nuisance. <clears throat> when you see an Islamic, when you have an Islamic government, there are certain Islamic punishments that are to be carried out for certain crimes committed. For example, theft. Theft, we all, we all know that they say you have to sever the hand, or of course, to the, according to the fiqh of the Ahlul Bayt, the fingers of of the thief. So you hear that, you're like, okay, that means that everyone who, who's a thief, has this has to happen. No, there are 20 plus conditions, they say, for a thief's fingers to be cut off because of theft. One of them being, he has to pick a lock. If he just saw your cash sitting there and he picked it up, that's not enough for his fingers to be chopped off if he is caught and is taken to the Islamic Hakim. The Islamic jurist. No, that's not enough. He has to have picked a lock, put his hand in there, and taken something out. There has to be a, a, an amount that he stole. One or two bucks isn't going to cut it. There's a certain amount. It, it's not supposed to be a, a year of drought and hardship and so on. There's lots of conditions. Anyway, so a person, when they see this rule, they think, okay, every thief's fingers have to be cut off. But when he looks at the conditions, the con conclusion he will draw is that not too many thieves' fingers will be cut off. Then why did Allah set such a rule then? Doesn't Allah want these rules to be carried out? Maybe He doesn't. Maybe He just wants us to be a little bit afraid, to not go towards those haram. But if we did, maybe He doesn't want that punishment to be carried out. There are other... And when I say this, I will tell you what year of Hawza our teacher taught us this. Okay, This is not me saying it. This is Hajar Ghayy Mu'ayyidi, year 6, we were studying Lum'ah when he told us this. This is one of the greats, brothers and sisters. He was telling us this. And that's where I, when I heard it there, I said, in the year 2015, when I go to Zainabiyah, I'm going to share this <laughs> with the people. That just because it's there doesn't mean it has to be necessarily carried out. Yes, if the conditions are met, it has to be carried out. But if the conditions aren't met, we don't have to look for people that we're going to carry it out on just because it's there. 
just because the Qur'an has talked about many of the details about a home full of fire that Allah has created, doesn't mean necessarily now 50% of the people have to go there or else Allah is upset. No. Inshallah. We are of the ones who are saved from the fire of the hell. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi